Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. On March 5, 1972, the residents of McKaysville, Georgia were in mourning. Their beloved former town doctor had lost his battle with leukemia and passed away at age 83, leaving behind a wife, son, and daughter. Doc Hicks had a reputation as being the kind of doctor everyone needs. He'd do anything for anyone. In the poor, remote copper mining town straddling the Georgia-Tennessee border in the Blue Ridge Mountains, people didn't always have money for medical services. And if they did, it often wasn't enough. But Dr. Hicks provided a level of care and various services without judgment or demanding payment from those who truly couldn't afford life-saving treatment. It wasn't unusual for him to be paid in a sack of potatoes. He was part of the fabric of McKaysville and was said by many to be not only one of the best physicians, but one of the best men they knew. However, others took a different view. The same man who had donated an organ to the local church and gave medicine away for free had once stolen a watch from the arm of a dying patient. So not everyone was a fan of Dr. Hicks. But 25 years after his death, a much greater scandal would emerge. It rocked not just the small town, but the entire country. The Hippocratic Oath all physicians must uphold throughout their career is above all else, do no harm. The people of McKaysville were about to discover that someone they had trusted with their lives and who they felt been nothing but professional was accused of something so harmful and so contrary to the nature of the man they knew It was hard to believe. Welcome to episode 203, The Hicks Babies. Thomas Juggerthy Hicks was born on October 18, 1888, in Bloomington, Tennessee, to parents David and Mary. One of six children, he graduated from Emory University Medical School in 1917, and that summer married 24-year-old Sullivan County woman Chas Copeland. The couple settled in Copper Hill, Tennessee, and had three children. Their son also became a doctor, but died suddenly in 1967 at age 44. While Chas became a Sunday school teacher, her husband took a job with the Tennessee Copper Company. Treating minors, he diagnosed with fatal lung conditions. But in 1932, when the doctor was discovered submitting an excessive amount of claims compared to the size of the company's workforce, he was fired. Dr. Hicks ran into trouble again in 1943, serving time in jail for illegally selling narcotics and was subsequently struck off in Tennessee. Despite this setback, just 10 months later, following his release, the doctor opened a clinic several blocks away from his home. It was just across the border in the tiny North Georgian town of McKaysville in Fannin County, home to just over 2,000 people. The unassuming blonde brick one-story building had distinctive green and white striped awnings. McKaysville is the twin city of Copper Hill, Tennessee. Both Appalachian towns are situated along one river, whose name varies depending on where you are in relation to the state line. In Tennessee, it's the Ocoee River, while in Georgia, it's the Tacoa River. The state line itself runs right through downtown McKaysville, through the grocery store parking lot. Dr. Hicks was well-respected and warmly embraced by the community. He was personable, charming, and made house calls regardless of the hour. Patients felt at ease in his presence and trusted him without a question. He became a charter member of the Adams Bible class of the town's First Baptist Church, president of the Kiwanis Club, and a member of Copper Hill Lodge. But Dr. Hicks was working at a time when reproductive rights for women in Georgia were non-existent. In the 1940s and 50s, conservative Southern America Birth control wasn't readily available and unmarried mothers were much aligned. Anyone finding themselves unexpectedly pregnant and not wanting to be was thrust into a terrifying world of fear and uncertainty. It was the same for married women who couldn't afford another mouth to feed. Many women died as a result of a lack of access to safe and affordable abortions, either through trying to perform one themselves, having one at the hands of an unqualified backyard operator, or by suicide. According to the Akron Beacon Journal, 
Dr. Hicks advertised what he called pregnancy care services on phone booths, overpasses, and at bus stations. For $100, about $1,200 in today's money, he performed safe abortions when many other physicians wouldn't. Of course, adoption was an option, but this process had recently been the subject of much scandal at a national level when the crimes of Tennessee woman Georgia Tan were exposed just before her death in 1950. Back in 2020, I released episode 95 on Georgia Tan, entitled Pedophile Kidnapper and Inventor of Modern Adoption. From the 1920s, Tan trafficked over 5,000 children, selling them to wealthy families. Other children, including 19 unidentified victims, died of extreme abuse and neglect at the Memphis branch of the Tennessee Children's Home Society. Southerners were horrified that something like this could happen in their own backyard. Surely, they thought, with Tan's death and the sordid nature of her actions exposed, society's most vulnerable would never again be exploited on such a scale. But they were wrong. Over in Georgia, word was now getting around that Dr. Hicks could arrange a discreet way for his pregnant patients to adopt their babies out to loving families he had lined up himself with privacy guaranteed and minimal fuss. He was already performing abortions, so this seemed to many women a legitimate way to solve the embarrassing or financially stressful problem of an unplanned pregnancy. And it was an option for those women who didn't want a baby but were personally opposed to abortion. Dr. Hicks arranged temporary housing for some of the expectant mothers for several months. He also covered their medical costs and care during their stay at either his farm, the New York Hotel in Copper Hill, Tennessee, or in his apartments in the telephone company building. When the time came for women to deliver, Dr. Hicks got on the phone to prospective parents, but none of them were vetted the way they are today. After giving the new parents only 24 hours to get to McKaysville, Dr. Hicks sold the newborns for anywhere from $800 to up to $10,000, $10,000 to $120,000 today. The usual amount was said to be around 1,000, which is about 12,600 today. According to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, some babies even went for as low as $100, 1,200 today. It's not known how much, if anything, was paid directly to the birth mothers. Parents couldn't choose the gender, but if you could pay, you could get yourself a baby. Dr. Hicks arranged a falsified birth certificate, which would be forwarded several weeks later, naming the adoptive parents as the birth parents, with the birth occurring in McKaysville, no questions asked. Dr. Hicks knew he had to minimize any paper trail, so he didn't keep any records of the birth mothers or families, linking them to their adoptive families out of state. No medical records and no accurate county court records of the births would ensure the entire operations was kept under wraps. The doctor's MO also prevented any birth mothers from changing their minds about giving up their babies. With no documents filed through a court to prove the adoption had occurred, they had no rights. Despite how traumatizing this must have been for many of Dr. Hicks's patients, some women gave birth multiple times at the clinic. While many of the women knew they were giving up their babies for adoption once they had delivered, it wasn't always this way. In a situation where it's hard to see that altruism was the sole motivator and not money, Dr. Hicks began taking infants from mothers who didn't want to give up their babies at all. After these newborns were delivered, they were whisked away and the dazed mother was told her child was stillborn. Meanwhile, a couple who assumed the baby wasn't wanted was waiting out back of the clinic to take their new baby home. Expectant mothers who very much wanted their children and trusted Dr. Hicks were lied to. Dr. Hicks didn't flaunt what was happening behind closed doors. Locals put two and two together, but didn't ask questions about what seemed to be an open secret. Women arrived from out of town in cabs and even by plane. Pregnant teens and young women from wealthy Southern families arrived in McKaysville at all hours of the day and night to see the doctor. It wasn't unusual to see limousines parked in the clinic's back alley. But in December 1964, operations at the Hicks Clinic started to wind down. This wasn't due to the illegal adoptions, which were really more transactions being conducted literally out of the back door. 
Dr. Hicks was instead arrested for performing an abortion on a young woman from Cobb County. In return for the charges being dropped, the doctor agreed to surrender his Georgia medical license. According to the AJC, some believe the arrest was orchestrated by other doctors who were jealous of how well off Dr. Hicks was by this time. The years passed, and by the early 1990s, a woman in Akron, Ohio, named Jane Blasio, was on a mission. Since the age of six, Jane had known she was adopted. As a teen, she didn't ask too many questions, but she knew that one day she had to find out more about where she came from and hopefully her birth family. As a teenager, Jane had found an embroidered baby pillow in her attic. It had her name and her birth date as January 15, 1965. But Jane had always been told her birthday was December 6, 1964. Her birth date was backdated to December 1964 to avoid any repercussions for Dr. Hicks, who had continued to practice even though he had surrendered his medical license. In 1988, following the death of her mother, Jane's father told her the story of how she came to join the family. After losing a child at birth and being turned down by local adoption agencies, her parents bought Jane's older sister, Michelle, from the Hicks Clinic in 1961. Michelle was sold for $800 plus the cost of a new outfit for her birth mother. Jane followed a few years later. She was sold for $1,000. But with her original birth certificate falsified, there was no way for Jane or any other Hicks babies, as they came to be known, to trace birth families the usual way. Legitimate adoption agencies turned down Jane's parents because her mother had been previously divorced. Then they heard about the Hicks Clinic from a relative who had purchased a baby. To get help with her birth records, Jane sought the assistance of Fannin County probate judge, Linda Davis. Together, they uncovered around 50 birth records between 1955 and 1964, where the registered birth of place was McKaysville, but the parents' usual address was Akron, a 12-hour drive away. This made no sense and suggested that something illegal had definitely occurred. In 1960 alone, six of the 50 babies born in Fannin County, just over 10%, were sold through the clinic to out-of-state families. Judge Davis eventually uncovered records of at least 200 infants born at the clinic and handed out the rear of the premises into the waiting arms of their new families. That averages out to just over one baby a month. They often wore little more than a diaper, came with no supplies, and were still covered in vernix, the waxy white substance found coating the skin of newborn babies. Georgia Superior Court records confirmed that none of the babies had been adopted through the appropriate legal channels. But how did so many babies end up in Ohio? And how did their adoptive families find out about Dr. Hicks? 49 of the 200 babies were sold to couples from Summit County, Ohio, through a woman only known as Ruth. Ruth had grown up in McKaysville and her family knew Dr. Hicks. She later moved to Ohio, where she worked for West Akron Goodrich and bought four babies of her own through the clinic. As word spread around Akron that people wanting a baby could get one from Georgia for the right price, Ruth became the facilitator. Prospective parents contacted the clinic, putting their names on a waiting list and waiting by the phone for Dr. Hicks's call. 47 of the Summit County babies went to homes where the father worked for the Akron Tire Company, the remaining two newborns were sold to a doctor in the Ohio city of Cayuga Falls. As word spread to prospective parents, couples from 11 states, including Arkansas, New Jersey, Oregon, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, contacted Dr. Hicks to arrange the purchase of a newborn. According to the New York Times, Judge Davis believes most of the adoptive families were not rich but working class. Ruth later refused to discuss her involvement in what happened. If she was alive today, she'd be 104, so she's likely passed away. Given how often the adoptions were happening in such a small town, some later wondered whether Dr. Hicks himself had fathered some of the children. But there's no evidence to suggest this occurred. And don't forget, it was common for Dr. Hicks's obstetrics patients to come from out of state and interstate. Jane Blasio made multiple trips to McKaysville and searched for answers. She suspected it would be difficult to get information, 
and was met with complete stonewalling. People didn't want to talk, much less entertain the thought of their beloved former doctor's reputation being besmirched when he wasn't even alive to defend himself. It became clear that Dr. Hicks was a man of contradictions who wore different masks, depending on who Jane talked to. Some claimed the doctor couldn't have possibly made a profit given he was covering medical and accommodation costs for his patients and their babies. In 1997, 25 years after Dr. Hicks's death, the ugly truth was about to get extremely uncomfortable for those who had held him in such high esteem. News of Jane's investigative work went public in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Akron Beacon Journal, and the New York Times. Calls started flooding into Judge Davis from those who thought they could be one of the Hicks babies. Many of the stunned townsfolk felt that Dr. Hicks's actions had not only saved lives, but helped prospective parents who did give their adoptive babies good homes, realize a dream they thought would never come true. Obviously, Dr. Hicks was dead by this time. But so were many who could have provided answers about what went on, including former nurses, his secretary, lawyer, and much of his family. His surviving granddaughter, Sally Sampirak, claims to not know anything specific about what occurred and rejects the assertion that it was a black market adoption operation. But she's supportive of Jane Blasio's quest to help others find their birth families. With no records left behind at the clinic, there was little to go on. But this didn't stop the genetic testing phase of Jane's work from kicking off. Jane became a professional investigator and expert in black market adoption. With the help of Judge Davis, she established McKaysville's Lost and Found, a confidential registry and support group for those connected to the former Hicks Clinic. She continues to dedicate much of her life to facilitating the connection of other Hicks babies with their birth families where possible. In 2017, Jane identified her own birth father. His name is Herbert Cruz, and he had died in 2010. However, her birth mother's identity remains elusive. It was believed her mother could have been Kitty Goss, who died in 1987 at age 38. Kitty was the oldest of nine children and lived in poverty. In the mid-1960s, she gave up two babies for adoption. DNA testing involving her son, Jamie, revealed an inconclusive link to Jane. Jane's advocacy work is not about seeking financial restitution, disrupting anyone's life, or setting out to violate anyone's privacy. It's simply giving people back the right to connect the dots about their medical history. A right taken away by someone who many believe benefited financially from the circumstances. In 2019, a six-part documentary about the Hicks babies and Jane's search for answers entitled Taken at Birth, aired on TLC. Two years later, Jane released her memoir of the same name. Many people in McKaysville and the adoptive parents are still alive and staunch in their support of Dr. Hicks. In 2014, then-Mayor Thomas Seabolt told the AJC, quote, everyone accepted that it happened in this town and they just rather let it go on. They maintain he provided a much-needed service during a time when reproductive rights and health care were largely underground. They argue that the babies born and sold through the clinic went on to grow up in loving homes with families who wanted nothing but the best for their children. And this last part is undoubtedly true. Many of the women who gave birth at the clinic, truly wanting to give their child a chance at a better life, felt they made the right decision at that moment in time but there's no getting away from the fact that Dr. Hicks also coerced, confused, and scared vulnerable young women who were on the fence about adoption into surrendering their babies. These women may very well have wanted to make it work, despite the stigma of being a single mother or the financial challenges of expanding an existing family. We can't forget that Dr. Hicks also lied and stole from other mothers. Mothers who were told that their babies, who were very much alive, were stillborn. This completely contradicts the narrative by some locals that the doctor didn't perform any services that weren't requested by a patient. Dr. Hicks went to great lengths to prevent people from ever being able to trace their birth families for something as straightforward as medical history. 
was he motivated by profit or charity while hoping to break even in the fees he charged? We'll probably never know. The pain and trauma Dr. Hicks caused to generations of families are undeniable, and many argue this is not negated by the overall level of care he provided to the broader community. It's doubtful he was the only physician in the South risking being stripped of their medical license for providing access to safe abortions. But it's unlikely these other doctors went to the lengths he did in deceiving and exploiting patients. Jane Blasio continues to advocate for open adoption and increased safeguards for all parties involved. To date, about 15 of the Hicks babies have found their birth parents thanks to DNA testing and Jane's help, along with the other Hicks babies. Seven birth mothers have also come forward, but time is running out for those who are still desperate for answers. The DNA testing occurred in 2014 in Tennessee and 30 people turned up from all across the country. Ancestry.com agreed to analyze their DNA for free. Previous testing was conducted in 1997, but potential matches were limited due to technology at the time. Jane originally said in 1997 of Hicks' actions, the villain is the circumstance. Today, on her website, it appears she takes a stronger position by saying, Doc Hicks was no saint and we recognize his dysfunction, the pain he caused many, and have learned to bear it. We'll probably never know how many babies were sold by Dr. Hicks. The complexities and complications of his legacy continue to affect hundreds of people today. Not just the Hicks babies themselves, but their adoptive families and those supporting them in their journey toward restoration. Indeed, many may still not know they were ever adopted through the clinic, if at all. And then, of course, there are those who discovered the circumstances of their adoption, but have since passed away without ever knowing the real story behind taking their first breath in McKaysville. If you or someone you know may be connected to the Hicks Clinic and is looking for assistance and support in their search, you can reach out to Jane Blasio at janeblasio.com. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Gemma Harris. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Today's episode was edited and mixed by Brendan Sheck Snyder of Southern Gothic and Erica Kelly. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the Listener Suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern Fried, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review. I'm also on all large platforms like iTunes, iHeart, Stitcher, and now Amazon and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care. <laughs>